I turn my thoughts towards falsehood, a species of it, however much more excusable than that of others, as I shall at least say one thing true when I tell you that I lie. And shall hope to escape the general censure by acknowledging that I mean to speak not a word of truth throughout. Know ye, therefore, that I am going to write about what I never saw myself, nor experienced, nor so much as heard from anybody else, and what is more of such things as neither are, nor never can be. I give my readers warning, therefore, not to believe me. Once upon a time, then, I set sail from the Pillars of Hercules, and getting into the western ocean, set off with a favourable wind. The cause of my peregrination was no more than a certain impatience of mind and thirst after novelty, with a desire of knowing where the sea ended, and what kind of men inhabited the several shores of it. For this purpose I laid in a large stock of provisions and as much water as I thought necessary, taking along with me fifty companions of the same mind as myself. I prepared with all a number of arms with a skilful pilot whom we hired at considerable expense, and made our ship as tight as we could in case of a long and dangerous voyage. We sailed on with a prosperous gale for a day and a night, but being still in sight of land did not make any great way. The next day, however, at sun rising, the wind springing up, the waves ran high. It grew dark, and we could not unfurl a sail. We gave ourselves up to the winds and waves, and were tossed about in a storm which raged with great fury for three score and nineteen days. On a sudden, a most violent whirlwind arose, and carried the ship above three thousand stadia, lifting it up far above the water, from whence it did not let us down again into the seas, but kept us suspended in mid-air. In this manner we hung for seven days and nights, and on the eighth beheld a large tract of land, like an island, round, shining, and remarkably full of light. We got on shore, and found on examination that it was cultivated, and full of inhabitants, though we could not then see any of them. As night came on, other islands appeared, some large, others small, and of a fiery colour. There was also below these another land, with seas, woods, mountains, and cities in it, and this we took to be our native country. As we were advancing forward, we were seized on a sudden by the Hippogobi, for so it seems they were called by the inhabitants. These Hippogobi are men, carried upon vultures, which they ride as we do horses. These vultures have each three heads and are immensely large. You may judge of their size when I tell you that one of their feathers is bigger than the mast of a ship. The Hippogopi have orders, it seems, to fly round the kingdom, and if they find any stranger, to bring him to the king. They took us, therefore, and carried us before him. And as soon as he saw us, he guessed by our garb what we were. You are Grecians, said he. Are you not? We told him we were. And how, added he, got ye hither through the air? We told him everything that had happened to us, and he, in return, related to us his own history, and informed us that he was also a man, and that his name was Endymion, that he had been taken away from our earth in his sleep, and brought to this place where he reigned as sovereign. That spot, he told us, which now looked like a moon to us, was the earth. He desired us with all not to make ourselves uneasy, for that we should soon have everything we wanted. If I succeed, says he, in the war which I am now engaged in against the inhabitants of the sun, you will be very happy here. We asked him what enemies he had, and what the quarrel was about. Phaeton, he replied, who is king of the sun. 
for that is inhabited, as well as the moon, has been at war with us for some time past. The foundation of it was this. I had formerly an intention of sending some of the poorest of my subjects to establish a colony in Lucifer, which was uninhabited. But Phaeton, out of envy, put a stop to it by opposing me in the midway with his Hippomyamises. We were overcome and desisted, our forces at that time being unequal to theirs. I have now, however, resolved to renew the war and fix my colony. If you have a mind, you shall accompany us in the expedition. I will furnish you, every one, with a royal vulture and other accoutrements. We shall set out tomorrow. With all my heart, said I, whenever you please. We stayed, however, and supped with him, and rising early the next day, proceeded with the army, when the spies gave us notice that the enemy was approaching. The army consisted of a hundred thousand, besides the scouts and the engineers, together with the auxiliaries, amongst them were eighty thousand hippogippi, and twenty thousand who were mounted on the Lachanopteri. These are very large birds, whose feathers are a kind of herb, and whose wings look like lettuces. Next to these stood the Cintraboli and the Scorodomachi. Our allies from the north were 3,000 Silatoxite and 5,000 Anemodromi. The former take their names from the fleas which they ride upon, every flea being as big as 12 elephants. The latter are foot soldiers and are carried about in the air, without wings, in this manner. They have large gowns hanging down to their feet. These they tuck up and spread in the form of a sail and the wind drives them about like so many boats. In the battle, they generally wear targets. It was reported that 70,000 Strathobalani from the stars over Cappadocia were said to be there, together with 5,000 Hippogorani. These I did not see, for they did never come. I shall not attempt, therefore, to describe them. Of these, however, most wonderful things were related. Such were the forces of Endymion. Their arms were all alike, their helmets were made of beans, for they have beans there of a prodigious size and strength, and their scaly breastplates of lupines sewed together, for the skins of their lupines are like a horn and impenetrable. Their shields and swords, the same as our own. The army ranged themselves in this manner. The right wing was formed by the Hippogippi, with the king and round him his chosen band to protect him, amongst which we were admitted. On the left were the Lachanopteri, the auxiliaries in the middle, the foot were in all about 60,000 myriads. Ooh, they have spiders, you must know, in this country in infinite numbers and of pretty large dimensions, each of them being as big as one of the islands of the Cyclades. These were ordered to cover the air from the moon quite to the morning star, this being immediately done and the field of battle prepared, the infantry was drawn up under the command of Nictarion, the son of Eudinax. The left wing of the enemy, which was commanded by Phaeton himself, consisted of the Hippomyrmyces. These are large birds and resemble our ants, except in regards to size, the largest of them covering two acres. These fight with their horns and were in number about 50,000. In the right wing were the Ericanopes, about 5,000, all archers, and riding upon large gnats. To these succeeded the Aerochoruses, light infantry, but remarkably brave and useful warriors, for they threw out of slings exceedingly large radishes, which whoever was struck by died immediately, a most horrid stench exhaling from the wound. Behind these stood 10,000 Caulomycetes, heavy armed soldiers who fight hand to hand, so called because they use shields made of mushrooms and spears of the stalks of asparagus. Near them were placed the Cinnabalani, about 5,000 who were sent by the inhabitants of Sirius. These were men well, with dogs' heads and mounted upon winged acorns. Some of their forces did not arrive in time, amongst whom there were to have been some slingers from the Milky Way together with the Nephila Centauri. They indeed came when the first battle was over, and I wish they had never come at all. The slingers did not appear at all, which, they say, so enraged Phaeton, they set their city on fire. 
Thus prepared, the enemy began the attack, the signal being given and the asses braying on each side, for such are the trumpeteers they make use of on these occasions. The left wing of the Heliots, unable to sustain the onset of our Hippogippi, soon gave way, and we pursued them with great slaughter. Their right wing, however, overcame our left, the Aerocopenes falling upon us with astonishing force and advancing even to our infantry. By their assistance we recovered and now they began to retreat when they found the left wing had been beaten. The defeat then becoming general, many of them were taken prisoners and many slain. The blood flowed in such abundance that the clouds were tinged with it and looked red, just as they appear to us at sunset. From thence it distilled through upon the earth, some such thing, I suppose, happened formerly amongst the gods, which made Homer believe that Jove rained blood at the death of Sarpedon. When we returned from our pursuit of the enemy, we set up two trophies, one on account of the infantry engagement in the spider's web, and another in the clouds for our battle in the air. Thus, prosperously, everything went on, when our spies informed us that the Nephila centaurs who should have been with Phaeton before the battle, were just arrived. They made, indeed, as they approached towards us, a most formidable appearance, being half-winged horses and half-men, the men from the waist upwards almost as big as the Rhodian Colossus, and the horses of the size of a common ship of burden. I have not mentioned the number of them, which was really so great that it would appear incredible. They were commanded by Sagittarius from the Zodiac, as soon as they learned that their friends had been defeated, they sent a message to Phaeton to call him back, whilst they put their forces into order of battle and immediately fell upon the Selenites, who were unprepared to resist them, being all employed in the division of the spoil. They soon put them to flight, pursuing the king quite to his own city, and slew the greatest part of his birds. They then tore down the trophies, ran over all the field woven by the spiders, and seized me two of my companions. Phaeton at length coming up, they raised other trophies for themselves. As for us, we were carried that very day to the Palace of the Sun, our hands bound behind us by a cord of the spider's web. The conquerors determined not to besiege the City of the Moon, but when they returned home resolved to build a wall between them and the sun, that his rays might not shine upon it. This wall was double, and made of thick clouds, so that the moon was always eclipsed, and in perpetual darkness. Endymion, sorely distressed at these calamities, sent an embassy, humbly beseeching them to pull down the wall, and not to leave him in utter darkness, promising to pay them tribute, to assist them with his forces, and never more to rebel. He sent hostages with all. Phaeton called two councils on the affair, at the first of which they were all inexorable, but at the second changed their opinion. A treaty at length was agreed to on these conditions. The Heliots and their allies on one part make the following agreement with the Selenites and their allies on the other. That the Heliots shall demolish the wall, now erected between them, that they shall make no eruptions into the territories of the moon, and restore the prisoners according to certain articles of ransom to be stipulated concerning them, that the Selenites shall permit all the other stars to enjoy their rights and privileges, that they shall never wage war with the Heliots, but assist them whenever they shall be invaded, that the king of the Selenites shall pay to the king of the Heliots an annual tribute of ten thousand casks of dew, for the insurance of which he shall send ten thousand hostages, that they shall mutually send out a colony to the Morning Star, in which whoever of either nation shall think proper may become a member, that the treaty shall be inscribed on a column of amber in the midst of the air and on the borders of the two kingdoms. This treaty was sworn to on the part of the Heliots by Pyrenides and Theritus and Phlogius, and on the part of the Selenites by Nictor and Menarus and Polylampus. Such was the peace made between them, the wall was immediately pulled down, and we were set at liberty. When we returned to the moon, our companions met and embraced us, shedding tears of joy, as did Endymion also. He entreated us to remain there, or to go along with the new colony, 
This I could by no means be persuaded to, but begged he let us down into the sea. As he found I could not be prevailed on to stay, after feasting us most nobly for seven days, he dismissed us. I will now tell you everything which I met within the moon that was new and extraordinary. Amongst them, when a man grows old, he does not die, but dissolves into smoke and turns to air. They all eat the same food, which is frogs, roasted on the ashes from a large fire. Of these they have plenty which fly about in the air. They get together over the coals, snuff up the scent of them, and this serves them for victuals. Their drink is air, squeezed into a cup, which produces a kind of dew. He who is quite bald is esteemed a beauty among them, for they abominate long hair, whereas in the comets it is looked upon as a perfection at least, so we heard from some strangers who were speaking of them. They have, notwithstanding, small beards, a little above the knee, no nails to their feet, and only one great toe. They have honey here, which is extremely sharp, and when they exercise themselves, wash their bodies with milk. This, mixed with a little of their honey, makes excellent cheese. Their oil is extracted from onions, is very rich and smells like ointment. Their wines, which are in great abundance, yield water, and the grape stones are like hail. I imagine, indeed, that whenever the wind shakes their vines and bursts the grape, then comes down among us what we call hail. They make use of their belly, which they can open and shut as they please, as a kind of bag or or pouch to put anything in it they want. It has no liver or intestines, but is hairy and warm within, insomuch that newborn children, when they are cold, frequently creep into it. The garments of the rich amongst them are made of glass, but very soft. The poor have woven brass, which they have here in great abundance, and by pouring a little water over it, so manages to card it like wool. I am afraid to mention their eyes, lest from the incredibility of the thing you should not believe me. I must, however, inform you that they have eyes which they take in and out whenever they please, so that they can preserve them anywhere till occasion serves, and then make use of them. Many who have lost their own borrow from others, and there are several rich men who keep a stock of eyes by them. Their ears are made of the leaves of plane trees, except of those who spring, as I observed to you, from acorns. These alone have wooden ones. I saw likewise another very extraordinary thing in the king's palace, which was a looking-glass that is placed in a well not very deep. Whoever goes down into the well hears everything that is said upon the earth, and if he looks into the glass, beholds all the cities and nations of the world as plain as if he were close to them. I myself saw several of my friends there, and my whole native country. Whether they saw me also, I will not pretend to affirm. He who does not believe these things, whenever he goes there, will know that I have said nothing but what is true. <laughs>